almost immediately. My goodness, he really is bleeding. That's 12! How much? Oh, that's my What's all in my mouth? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I saw it! That one has some good air tone. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we oh, go! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah. oh my God. Look at it! Here we go! Look at the size of that thing! God. It just moved down a little bit on us. Right under my hand. I mean, you really been. Well, it gets you when you're out here and it's tight, so you're cruising, but you're just really going real fast. And it just goes right by you. Oh, you yeah. come up by the boat, oh, and it comes right by your head. All you do is see a silver blur right by your head. You go, oh, man, that's blue. Kind of like that one earlier. Yeah. Yeah. The very first one. Yeah. Well, as you can see, this really is an exciting adventure. These fish come leaping out of nowhere, landing in the boat, slamming into you, and immediately upon landing in the boat, they, they begin doing, they begin flopping around, then they begin oozing slime, and they begin bleeding. Now, you'll see, as you've seen in the video, they begin bleeding almost immediately on impact. They're very sensitive and they bleed from the gills, they bleed from their soft head, where they have no scales on their head and they just make a mess out of a boat. So fishermen are concerned obviously for safety reasons, but also for having to clean up. Fishermen are having to adapt obviously to this new peril that they have out onto the river. And they uh, uh, joke about having a CDD on their boat. Now that's a carp deflection device. <laughs> and I've seen everything from a metal trash can lid that they kind of use as a shield to batter the fish as they come flying at them as they're driving down the, uh, the riverways. Uh, and commercial fishermen are actually installing plexiglass barriers in front of where the, the pilot of the boat will stand uh, so that the fish actually deflect off of this barrier and you can kind of hide behind it uh, because it is so dangerous. You can imagine these fish can swim up to 20 miles an hour and if they're cruising just under the surface of the water at 20 miles an hour and a boater's coming along at 30 miles an hour and that fish leaps up we've got a, a an impact that's dangerous to the extreme uh, to anybody in that boat that might become uh, impacted from that flying fish. I mean, are they jumping in the boat when you're moving along? Well, that or if you're sitting still and you rev your motor I'm going to play with them just see what they do. They'll jump over you it's, it's amazing what they do. Now these aren't just little fish either. No, they're they're 20 pound fish. <laughs> is it is it is it, a, is it a safety concern when you're out boating? Well, yes. If you, I would, I've never been hit, but I'm sure they have been people that's gotten hit. I've seen um, the carps themselves jump in the boat, and as they're flying, they they've cut uh, a woman that I was with all the way down from her mid thigh to her mid calf, and the same day we were doing about 15 20 miles an hour on the river, and it just Stop the pontoon boat, Dennis tracks. Everybody fell down. I mean, they're they're a serious hazard. I mean, and there's no real way to get rid of them. So how many do you see at a time? <sighs> That's a gamble. Bunches. It's hard telling everywhere. It just depends on where you're at. If you get in the right cove, it's hard telling if you won't have 15 in the boat. Yep. And if there's just not 15, there's at least five. <laughs> what do you do with them when they jump in the boat? Kick them off. <laughs> yeah, kick them out. <laughs> it's and like hope, a gar or anything and, else. I hope you, they stay out. There's <laughs> nothing you can really do with them. No. Well, they said that there's someone in Illinois that's going to process them down, send them back over to Japan or China or somewhere, supposedly going to buy them. Sell yes. them back to where they came from, yeah. huh? Stay right there. We'll be back right after this commercial break. If you own timberland or open land, Hawbury Forestry Consulting 
specializes in timber sales, timber management, and wildlife habitat management for private landowners. We are also experienced with timber stand improvement, contract tree planting, and reforestation work. Our specialty is wildlife habitat management. If you own land and want to see an increase in deer, turkey, quail, and grouse populations on your property, we can tailor a management plan specifically for your needs. Enter to win a free turkey hunt with Indiana's 2010 Turkey Calling Champion. Indiana Outdoor Adventures is offering a free drawing to anyone age 18 years and older. The winner will receive a two-day turkey hunt in southern Indiana with Indiana Outdoor Adventures pro staff member and state turkey calling champion Jack Rollins. The winner will receive a gift pack of custom-made turkey calls, a weekend stay in a log cabin, and your hunt will be aired next season as part of Indiana Outdoor Adventures. Enter online today at www.indianaoutdooradventures.com. One entry per person. The drawing will be held March 31st, 2011. Man, I've been all over this farm. We're in a burden five miles of this place. Hey, man. Obviously, that ain't work. Try this Derby City call. Old Girl Striker. Take it for a ride. <laughs> now, that's what I'm talking about. Check out our complete product line at DerbyCityCalls.com. Derby City, it's your call. Follow Indiana Outdoor Adventures online with Facebook, Twitter, and our website. Stay up to date with our exciting adventures as we're out in the field filming and meeting new people. From news updates and announcements to Twitter posts by co-host Troy McCormick. Why wait until the next season of shows when you can follow us as we're filming them? Join us online to get the most current news on Indiana Outdoor Adventures. Welcome back to Indiana Outdoor Adventures. We're going to change subjects and location. We're going to head over to Seymour, Indiana, and we're going to talk to Rob Hobry of Hobry Forestry Consulting to learn a little bit about regenerative forest practices. We're going to take a look at why to cut timber and how it's going to improve the quality of the timber for both uh, financial gain and for wildlife. This is a regeneration opening. Uh, this is our family farm. We had a selective harvest here. Uh, they, they harvested the timber in August. So what we're doing is coming back this winter after the opening that was created from the timber harvest, we're going to come back into that opening and go ahead and finish it. All the young trees, all the small trees that are poor quality, the species that we don't want to grow in here, we're, we're actually going to come down or come in, cut them down, spray them with herbicide so they can come back. And, and our goal on this is within three to five years, this will be an extremely thick area, a good area for turkeys to nest, a good area for deer to bed. Plus, we're also going to receive the benefits of natural regeneration because of the sunlight we've created from the harvest. But if you don't do the post-harvest timber stand improvement, then you can get the opening full of a lot of undesirable species that are poor quality that you don't want. Why did you pick this spot and how did you decide what to take out? The first step in this process was we d I chose these particular trees. You can see the stumps behind me. We chose these trees because they were large trees, they had exceptionally large crowns, and they were taking up a lot of room on a per acre basis. We didn't have a lot of young timber coming in around them. As you can see out and about, around this area we have a lot of stems per acre, which, which is what we want to grow the quality that we need. So we chose, we selected these trees, marked them, sold them, and then after they were sold and cut down, then we come in to finish the opening. And our goal in here is within 15 years, we'll have a nice even age stand like we have right next to us over here. So you took out the over mature species. Correct. You left some desirable species. That's correct. And now you're coming in taking out the smaller undesirable species. That's right. And on some of these areas, uh, if you watch as we cut, some of the trees, uh, some of the stems that we cut, we won't spray. Some of them we will spray. The undesirables are the ones we want to spray with the herbicide so, because we don't want them to sprout back. 
the cherry, some of the oak that may have been damaged from the harvest, we'll go ahead and cut them off, leave a two inch stump. They will re-sprout because the root system is still alive and they've already got a start. So we want them to come back and sprout back. Now in this opening, you may find uh, a few white oak here, a few ash here, a few cherry here, and we're just gonna leave those. They'll, they'll grow, they're small enough to grow. But any of the sassafras, any of the elm, uh, any of the, maybe the sweet gum, we have sweet gum on this site, we'll go ahead and cut it and kill it because what our goal here is, is to get a lot of oak regeneration, a lot of popper, a lot of ash and cherry. And if you look around, we have a lot of black oak and some white oak around this site. And that seed is already here. We just need the sunlight to get it to sprout. Tell us about the overmature canopy and why it keeps the sunlight out. Well, the over the especially this tree right here behind me, this tree was a very large tree, had a double stem. So as that tree grew, it took more sunlight. And as it as the trees around it continued to grow, that tree continued to reach out over what is now the opening. So you may we may have had one tree that took up a whole one-fifth acre of an of a of a of an area within the forest stand. And because of that, we wanted to get more sunlight in here. And tell me what this whole process, what would you uh, call this whole process that we're doing? This whole process is called timber stand improvement. And we call it because the harvest has already taken place, this is considered post-harvest timber stand improvement, or some people call it forest improvement. And we will actually, we'll come through and cut all the stems down. We'll actually go ahead and cut the vines and treat the vines as well. Great vines. If I have a client, who owns a, a large tract of timber. His rate of return is going to be, be increased or is going to be higher if it is actually a managed stand. Now, if, if he owns a tract of timber and it's been in his family, say 60 or 70 years, and they've never sold timber, and they have a lot of large trees and fewer stems per acre, they may have one good harvest within that 70 year period. Versus if I have a client whose family has actually managed that track of timber over the last 50 years, they may have had two or three harvests in that, in that forest stand. And because they've created the openings and because they've removed the large trees that have allowed the younger trees to grow, their rate of return may be 10, 15, 30% higher. For example, he may have sold timber three times in 50 years and generated $150,000 worth of income versus the one gentleman who, whose family has owned the track of timber 70 years and uh, only sold timber once and they may have had an $85,000 timber sale. So your rate of return is actually going to be increased if it's actively managed and managed sustainably. The larger the trees get, just like this tree here that we had removed, the fewer young stems that you're going to have per acre. And if you don't have the young stems per acre, you don't have the next generation coming along. But we really appreciate you joining us here today, and we'll see you again next time right here on Indiana Outdoor Adventures.